This program is brought to you by the partners of A Root Awakening International. Help others find truth. Support A Root Awakening International today. The Messianic Church was involved in more world history than you think. Everything from the Renaissance to St. Patrick to bluegrass music, it all has Hebrew roots. And tonight, Dr. Miles Jones peels back the centuries to reveal the truth of Jehovah's people through the ages. Because it's the end of the sixth day, the sun is set, and this is Shabbat Night Live. Well, Shabbat Shalom, Torah fans. Welcome to Shabbat Night Wait Live. Wait just a minute, I have a rude interruption. Wait a minute. The Michael Rood? Is Michael Rood in the studio? What? Well, yeah, hey, Michael. Here. Uh, Scott, you came from Canada just before I went in the hospital, and you were supposed to learn so, so to speak by now. And it's not Shabbat Night, night Live, it's Shabbat Night Live. It Because you haven't been live for a year now. <laughs> oh, wait a minute. Okay, point taken, point taken. <laughs> All right, well. So, so this is this is a commercial for, for my pillow. This is my pillow right here. And now <laughs> we have a word for, from Scott Laird on hair, <laughs> hair loss. <laughs> oh, wait a but minute. But before, before you get, get to that, I want to thank everyone for praying for me and then I would be back here again with you. And during this time, Nehemiah Gordon has got his doctor's degree from Israel, and, and he is going to be with us for many special events coming up. So don't miss a single time uh, of our series. Thank you. Oh, oh wow, wow, that's okay. great. Woo. Thank you, Love Michael. Love having Michael back in wow. the studio. It's great to have Michael back in the studio. And giving me heck and everything. I know it, right? <laughs> I don't know, but I think you resembled some of those remarks there, I think it would be very irresponsible of me to guide anybody <laughs> on hair loss. Yeah. Wow. Speak, <laughs> well, speaking of Nehemia Gordon, Dr. Nehemia Gordon, once again, congratulations, Nehemia, on getting your doctorate. And he's coming up with... Passover because he's going to be here for Passover with us, Scott. Indeed, yes, Passover. Now, now, Passover is not going to be this month. It's going to be next month, as we're seeing on the astronomically and agriculturally corrected biblical Hebrew calendar. Yes, the barley was not Aviv, just like a Shabbat not live. Okay, they got it right this time. Okay, so as expected, <laughs> and now the new moon has the new moon has been seen. So at least, so now that means our Passover 22 and 22 event is coming up uh, April 15 to 16. We're actually moving it. So let's talk about that with my co-host, the Chief Operating Officer of Rude Awakening, Ted Clayton. Wow, I don't All know right. if I can even be on here now that Michael's <laughs> been here with us. Goodness gracious. Well, I tell you what, one of the big things we want to say is, Michael, we love you, we thank you, and we can't appreciate you enough, man. You are just fantastic, and we're so glad to have you in the studio with us here as we're talking about Passover coming. And Scott, there's been something called an ADAR bet that just happened. Tell yes, us about now, that. Without Michael's teachings, I would not know about the ADAR bet, nor how it tied into Yeshua's 70-week ministry. So uh -huh. what this is, is if the barley is not Aviv, mm -hmm. by the end of the 12th month, the 12th month of Adar, we have to do what's called an Adar bet, which basically means Adar the sequel, or yeah. Adar part two, because yeah. bet means two in Hebrew. So that's what's happened this year. So now we add a 13th month as seen on the calendar right there. So that's what we're into now. We are in the 13th month. Now, this mention, or this, uh, this happened in Yeshua's ministry as well. Okay. In fact, Yeshua's ministry would not have been 70 weeks without an Adar bet. Oh. Because at the end of the 12th month, right before, well, actually a month before he was crucified, uh, the, new, or the barley was not uh, Aviv. 
And so okay. he had more time. So that's when you see Yeshua going up to the Galilee one more time and doing another speaking tour, if you will, before he comes back. And then uh, everything hits the fan and he's crucified at Passover. But th without the 13th month, this would not have equaled 70 weeks from the time he was baptized to the time he baptized his followers with the Holy Spirit at Pentecost. Wow, okay, so now how do people know, um, how do people know there's an Adar bit? Do they have to go looking to see if the barley they literally do. Yes, there's actually a group, uh, friends of ours, that go out in Israel. Uh, this is Devorah Gordon and her group. Yes. Uh, she will go out and they will literally check uh, plots of barley in several parts of Israel. They'll check the north, they'll check the south, near Jerusalem in the middle, all over the place. And they will see if any barley is a aviv. Now, what does aviv mean? So aviv means, is it going to be ready to harvest and do a, basically a, a ceremony with it mm -hmm, uh, mm -hmm. at Passover time. Okay. So, it, so basically they're looking at, it's, it's not ripe at the time. Aviv means it's going to be ripe in about two weeks. And it's a special, gotcha. it's a special point at which in the, in the uh, ripening process that is called Aviv. And okay. it's, it's a specific to the Hebrew calendar. So that's why that uh, Passover has moved from March to April and it'll be here April 15th and 16th. We got great special guests like Yehuda and Hadas Glick. Mm -hmm. We got Chef Hall coming in and he's gonna be uh, doing some cooking for us for Shabbat Night Live on Friday night. Uh, Nehemia, once again, Dr. Nehemia and Linnell Gordon are coming in and they're gonna be talking about uh, Passover celebrated, how it was celebrated then and the food that they were cooking then and now. So it's gonna be great. Uh, Keith Johnson's talking to Yehuda, like I said. And Scott, we have a special thing. Nehemia and Keith are going to have a special segment for this show this year. And also we're gonna have Coming back by popular request, we're going to have the panel discussion again with Nehemia, mm -hmm. Keith, you, and myself, and we're going to be talking about Passover, how it was celebrated then, how it should be celebrated now, and what we should do to honor Passover. Indeed, and that'd be a great thing for uh, folks who have Christian friends or non-Christian friends to say, well, you know, why do you do what you do? Well, I thought this Passover thing was a Jewish thing. That'd right. be, the panel discussion would be a great opportunity to watch and discover why folks do it today and in right. what context it's done today. So, And from all kinds of different perspectives because uh, Nehemia is Karaite Jew. Right. And of course, we're Messianic and, and so is Keith. And so it's a good, a good way to see both sides there. That's right. And we can't forget, of course, the great Seder that takes place at seven o'clock that night with Michael Rood, one of his greatest mm. Seders that he has done. We're bringing it back. And ladies and gentlemen, we just can't wait to see Michael teaching the Seder once again and just doing that great job with informing us on how Passover was then and how Passover is now. Indeed, and to help support the ministry, we wanna thank you very much for praying for Michael. As yes. you can see, he's doing just fine, oh, cracking yeah. jokes and everything. Oh yeah. So, uh, but we wanna thank you for supporting the ministry through the Love Gift Program. There's all kinds of uh, great gifts. And this month we have a teaching from Bill Cloud Oh yeah. About and, whom will you serve? And, and ladies and gentlemen, we really just want to thank Bill for being here with us and taking time out of his schedule and away from his church to come over and do these very special teachings. These are great teachings that are really poignant for today with all of the disruptions that are happening in the world today. Ladies and gentlemen, you're not going to want to miss a single moment of Bill's teaching, but you got to get it for the love gift. That's right. It's only available in March, and we'll let the we'll let the commercial say the rest. What's That's in, right. What all else is in there? Okay. Thank you, Ted. All right. So the Messianic Church was involved in more world history than you think. Everything from the Renaissance, St. Patrick, to bluegrass music, it all has Hebrew roots. Pirates and Heretics, episode two with Dr. Miles Jones is coming up. The Kiddush with Michael, however, is coming up next. We'll see you in two minutes. When measured against the word of Yehovah, some of man's laws are lawless, and there will soon come a point when you must decide whom you will serve. Using examples from the Torah, the New Testament, and from yesterday's headlines, Bill Cloud draws a striking parallel between the decisions made by heroes of the Bible and the decisions facing us in our modern world. In this month's love gift, whom will you serve? This is what I see taking shape, Scott. 
It is gonna to get to the point that we're gonna to have to make up our mind who we are more willing to offend, man or the Almighty. Who Will You Serve? Featuring special guest Bill Cloud is not for sale, and it's not on YouTube. The only way to watch it is to receive it as a thank you gift from Michael Rood. Donate a $50 love gift and we'll send you Who Will You Serve? on DVD or Blu-ray. Or for a donation of $100, We'll send you Whom Will You Serve? Plus a silver-plated kiddish cup and coaster with scenes of old Jerusalem. Or with a donation of $300, we'll send you Whom Will You Serve? The silver-plated kiddish cup and coaster. Plus a decorative bookend depicting a scene of worship at the Western Wall. These gifts are a limited time offer from Michael Rood to thank you for your support. Make your donation today and receive the $50 gift the $100 gift, or the $300 gift. These special gift collections featuring Bill Cloud are available only in March and supplies are limited. Call now to receive your gifts, 888-766-3610. That's 888-766-3610. Or get your gifts online at monthlylovegift.com. Join us online for Passover 2022, a time of remembering, learning, preparing for the greater exodus, and celebrating the power of family. Passover 2022 is free, but you must sign up to watch it live. Sign up now at PassoverCharlotte.com. First, on Friday night, it's Passover meal prep with Scott Laird and award-winning chef Rich Hall. Sign up now to get the recipes. Then get a sneak peek at all of this year's special guests on Shabbat Night Live. On Saturday, it's a full day of teachings from Scott Laird and Dr. Tom Lokensgaard, Nehemia and Linnell Gordon, Yehuda and Hadas Glick, and Keith Johnson. Plus, a panel discussion with all of our guests. And of course, a front row seat to Michael Rood's best Passover Seder ever. You'll even get 20% off almost anything in our online store and free coloring pages for the kids. Passover 2022, then and now. Sign up to watch it live at PassoverCharlotte.com. The night of the Last Supper, Yeshua took our tone, our tone, leavened bread, and he blessed the Most High, and he broke the bread and said, this represents my body, which will be broken for you. He took the cup, and he blessed the Most High and said, this represents the renewed covenant in my blood. The following day, the following day, on the 14th of the month of the Aviv, there were two large loaves on the wall of the temple. And when they took the first loaf down, after that, no more bread, no more leavened bread was eaten. Then when they took the second loaf down, that's when all of the leavened bread in the city of Jerusalem and everywhere else was completely expunged. It was burnt in the fire. That was the rehearsal that was done the following day, and just before the Passover lambs were sacrificed in preparation for the Feast of Unleavened Bread. But Yeshua represents in this very thing in the breaking of the bread that we do, in the Kiddush, in the sanctification, every Shabbat, we remember that his body was broken for us. By his stripes, we were healed. And in the taking of this cup, as we say this prayer in thanksgiving to Almighty God, Baruch Atah Yehovah Eloheinu Melech HaAlam, Borei Pri Hagafen. Yeshua said this, is the renewed covenant in my blood. As often as you do this, do this in remembrance of me. Every meal, any time, any Sabbath, any feast, any time that you need to remember his broken body and shed blood, we do this in remembrance of him.
When last we spoke, uh, you and I learned that we have a heritage with pirates <laughs> and heretics, uh, no less. Uh, thanks to the work of Dr. Miles Jones. Dr. Miles, thank you for joining us again on Shabbat Night Live. And now I understand that uh, along with this heritage, we have learned that uh, there is a history of chivalry and romantic love kind of was introduced to the world through the Messianic Church. You know, the Neo-Messianic Church, we're in the Middle Ages now. You're jumping the gun. We're not to the pirates yet. <laughs> I'm sorry, yes, we gotta talk more about pirates. But it is exciting. I feel like it's the climatic chapter, chapter 10 of the yeah. book. And by the way, thank you for coming back, folks. And if you missed the first episode, it's gonna be out on YouTube. But, yes. But we, you can go to writingofgod.com and we'll provide you with a free PDF of this presentation so that you have the outline of these things. It's free. And, uh, but, you know, support our ministry and purchase the book called Messianic Church Arising. Yes, brand new. And you can, you can show it up on the screen. And yeah, it's brand new, just in publication. And, uh, you know, buy it from us at writingofgod.com. We make, it doesn't cost you any more, but we make three times as much when we sell it off of our, our website for right, our because ministry. So it's a great way to support uh, this research. And uh, you go get the free download. You also get our free research updates newsletter. And uh, so you'll know what we're coming up with and we're coming up with new things all the time. We have... Uh, two complete manuscripts of the Brit Hadashah. Wow. The, the New Testament, the Renewed Covenant, in complete, complete, in Hebrew, from original sources. So some, some of the books we have three, some we even have four manuscripts in Hebrew. So we're learning incredible things about the, you know, these survived, the Hebrew gospel survived, and the Messianic church survived. That's how the Hebrew gospel survived, because the Messianic church survived, and it reappeared throughout the centuries, hmm. and then the church would try to crush it, and it would, it would move to a neighboring area where the churches would spring up again. Huge, huge evangelist. And one of the things that happened, and they made major, major accomplishments in the world, and this is one of them, okay? The Cathar church, which was predominant in the region of South uh, southern France, but parts of Italy and Spain also. And it was so, it was a revivalist movement, to, judging by the popularity of the people. I mean, it emptied out the Catholic churches. Many of the, the Catholic clergy became Cathars. Really? You know, it just swept through the country because uh, by this time, you got to remember, the apostate church, no surprise here, that had become so corrupt and the clerics, the friars, they had become extremely corrupt. Number one, they were practically all of them illiterate, right? Mm -hmm. So they did not really know scripture, but the, the common people were forbidden to read it because mm. it turned them into heretics, mm. right? They would read it and realize that the Cathars in Southern France, they were telling the truth about scripture because they were very learned. It is a marker of these messianic movements throughout history that they're huge on education. I mean, they learned different languages. We're talking about that kind of huge on education. They knew the scripture. They knew it in, uh, in Hebrew mm. and, and, and in um, Occitan in southern France. And they knew it in Greek sometimes. But they, they had a mastery of scripture. In fact, the Barbes, which was their, their, their uh, religious clerics that went, traveled the countryside, uh, were required to memorize the entire Gospel of Matthew. Hmm. So these were big on, and they led their followers to become uh, educated. Hmm. Every Messianic movement, every me and by the Middle Ages, we're talking about Neo-Messianics, that they were uh, uh, mostly Gentile now, right? But they were still, they still held to the same goal, and that was the restoration of the first century Messianic Apostolic Church. I didn't know that because even today yeah. you'll notice if you go to a Shabbat Midrash with a bunch of Gentiles who have discovered this type of thing, they have this desire to learn Hebrew, to yeah. learn Greek, no, yes, to absolutely. really dive into the scripture and are really learned people. So the, the Old Testament really had been pretty much tossed out the window by the new Greek church. Hmm. You know, you weren't allowed to read the Bible, number one. And they had changed all the holidays. They had made some really significant changes to, to the message that Yeshua carried. So they didn't want you to read the scriptures. Right. Because then you'd become aware that the story you're getting from the apostate church is different from what it says in scripture. And they pretty much threw out the Old Testament because the Torah was in there and that you can't. Can't have the Torah. 
<laughs> no, he can't have that. That's a Jewish thing, right? So, so that was pretty much tossed. And then when people got the scripture back in their own languages, they started to read it and started to focus in on this Old Testament as really the instructions from Jehovah as to how to live our lives, right? And it automatically Absolutely. made a huge difference. So we're talking, and here's, here's one way in which it happened. Uh, uh, <coughs> from the East... Mm-hmm. The Cathars came and they brought this new idea of chivalry because military, you know, encounters were basically about slaughter. Slaughter all your opponents, right? And then put your people in there. Yeah. Right? Okay, and they, they had this new ideal of what it was like to be a warrior. You could be a spiritual warrior, one whose ultimate goal is to search and find the Holy Grail. You know, the chalice. And this is very symbolic, right? Mm-hmm. It's not necessarily, you're not actually... Not literal. ...object necessarily. Yeah. But the, the grail that the, the Messiah himself drank from so that you could learn, you know, what they called the good and the light. You know, so you could, you could learn to be operating in a spiritual dimension. And this became a really important ideal in the Middle Ages it's called chivalry. And courtly love was the earliest thing. And it was, yes, it started out as a movement of amorous love that came, but, but it, it later on was revived. And uh, oftentimes it, it really just meant devotion to your, your mate as if she's a queen. I mean, it really raised the status of women to equality. Well, in the Catholic Church, in the Celtic Church, in, in the, these churches, they, women were treated equally and they, were, they taught... They were educated and they taught right alongside of the men or on their mm-hmm. own, you know, but they were allowed to be clerics and teachers and, and uh, the, the whole schmear. It just radically changed our sense of the interrelation between men and women because women were treated much like property. Mm. Chattel, they called it, even if they were noble born. And now, now comes this idea that you should treat your woman that you've committed your life to as your queen. Well, men, give your lives to your bride as Yeshua gave exactly. himself for the church. Very, it's you can very see, biblical. You can see how biblical that is, mm-hmm. you know. So the, the status of the woman was just raised up by, by this neo-Messianic movement. And, and that has come into us to the West. This whole idea of romantic love is is, is chivalric idea because that wasn't present in marriages of the times. They were arranged marriages. You might be married to an old man, you hadn't even met him. You know, but he's Mm -hmm. rich, so your parents marry you to him. Or, you know, the the kings, they would take their queen had nothing to do with whether they loved them or not, you know, because they all had mistresses. Uh, But uh, this was a whole new idea that love should actually be the bond between the man and the woman. This is a chivalric idea. It was brought in by, by the Cathars. And uh, so, I mean, it, cha- it changed the world and still has, and we still look at it. It's called the Court of Love, and it was a product of the underground church, the Cathar Church. Mm. And the Cathar Church and the School of Martyrs, actually many of these Cathars, would go to Lombardy to the School of Martyrs. As we talked about last episode. Yeah, yeah. and, they, and they, would, they would learn there, and they would receive the gift of giving the Spirit, mm. uh, the, the baptism of the Holy Spirit. And they would go out, be educated and go out among the people. And they had expected to be martyred, and uh, they were. Uh, you know, but they, it was, to them, it was nothing more than like changing their clothes or cha- taking off a jacket. You know, and it isn't really, you know, because I, I think we mentioned this. I don't know if we mentioned it on air or not. That they learned that we are not earthly creatures having a temporary spiritual experience. We are spiritual creatures having a temporary earthly experience. We are spiritual warriors, drop behind any mean lines, and none of us is getting out of here alive. All right, so do you want to fear that? Or do you want to know that our real life is outside of this shrinking box of existence in a universe, an infinite universe full of our creator's infinite love and light? That's our home, our spiritual home. And they taught this. And so these, these neo-Messianic movements were dramatically evangelistic. Under the worst oppression, they sent out people all over the world and, and, and created churches everywhere. And the, generally, the, the, the apostate church would 
call them by a name and say, well, they're just a heretical sect. It's just a, a plague of heretical pests. But they weren't. They were really unified. Hmm. And I mean, it's not that there were no doctrinal differences. There were. But they were all unified in the restoration of the first century Messianic church, the restoration of the Messianic apostolic church of the apostle himself, of the, of the Messiah himself. Hmm. So this was practiced all over Occitania. Very, very powerful. Number six, right? <laughs> right? We, are do, we are going through 16, by the way, of these major accomplishments. 16 major and, accomplishments, not all the accomplishments, but there's major, major ones. And sometimes we clump them together. So there's, there's a lot to it, yes. right? But number six, <clears throat> The Celtic Church. Now, this is the Church of St. Patrick, and St. Patrick was a Messianic. The St. Patrick. The St. Patrick. Wow, okay. So this is beyond green beer and four-leaf clovers? Yep, this they is... they practice Passover, a Christian Passover, hmm. not Easter. They kept to the Jewish feast days, the Sabbath, the Saturday Sabbath. All really? Right. They even used the, the, the Hebrew calendar. All right, oh. they were in opposition to Rome. St. Patrick never set foot in Rome. He had no communication with Rome. Hmm. He was in opposition to Rome. Rome later appropriated his whole ministry, his whole narrative, made him a saint, you know. But what the, it took them, gosh, it took them uh, uh, almost a century you know, there weren't, there weren't even any Roman missionaries there until centuries later. But eventually, they got the nobles on their side, <clears throat> and by military force, they crushed the, the Celtic church. Hmm. All right, now this didn't end it, but they sent the clerics, uh, the Celtic clerics were banished. Uh, all these people went up into the mountains where they could, you know, practice their religion, you know, uh, you know, in their, in their own way, and they took this gospel with them. They took, you know, because they had the received text of the Bible. They had the Itala Bible. You know, they had these things. They had the truth. Oh, yeah, the Celtic church, they were huge on scholarship. During the Dark Ages, they were the light of the Western world. So you yeah, know, sorry, go ahead. I, I was no, going to say, that's strange, because, well, not strange, but it, it, it's news to me, because when we hear the Celtic church, when we think Celtic, we think, oh, Celtic, uh, paganism, witches, druids, all that dark, weird stuff that happened in yeah. Europe at that, that well, time. You, know, you they, don't think that this is this light uh, was... The, the church, the apostate church would practice any kind of slander, anything and everything. So, I mean, it's so bizarre and out there that you, you really just have to discount it unless there's some evidence to, to indicate that there was any truth to it. Mm. But it's just such exaggerated rhetoric. Of course, we don't know anything about exaggerated rhetoric in modern times, do we? <laughs> not at all. There's not about, about them demonizing their opponents. That yeah. doesn't happen anymore, thank God. Right? <laughs> <laughs> People demonizing their opponent, their their opponents, and accusing them of anything and everything they can try to make stick. Something's never changed, right? Yeah. Well, what, so Saint Patrick, he was known for a lot of. I mean, you have another slide on him here. So this is this is a large. Well, uh, and, and it's important. The study yeah. of these neo-Messianic churches is really important because these people were very knowledgeable. St. Patrick and Columba and then Columbanus. And uh, you just, it, it was a populist, revivalist religion. This, literally, the Shekinah glory of God came down mm. on these Celtic churches in various places. And they had what they call perennial prayer, Laos perennis in Latin. Okay. All right? And they, they had sometimes hundreds of people praying 24-7, night and day, every hour of the night wow. and day, they had people praising God so this Shekinah glory would remain with their church hmm. in the various centers, in Iona, you know, in Bangor, and in Whitfield. And the, these were all, you know, and, the, and the countries, the Celtic countries, they just felt like dominoes to these people. They could raise people from the dead. It was, it was a time of daily miracles just like the original Messianic church, wow. because it was the original Messianic church. Because St. Patrick was a Messianic. His parents were uh, of, of Hebrew stock, you know, that had been rounded up during the 70s, during mm -hmm. the, actually during the, uh, the Titus's time, right? When the, the Titus was the prince, Vespasian was the emperor at the time. Titus was his son, who was the prince. So when Daniel talks about the prince mm -hmm. in his prophecies, he's talking about Titus. Oh. And he, it, he was in charge of the army, said, encircled Jerusalem, all right? And they waited there. They wanted people to leave. 
because there'd be fewer people that have to fight, fewer people on the walls, yeah. right? Right, so the, the, so that's why the angel says, when you see this, uh, the army is encircling you, go. And so Simeon took the Messianic church to Pella. And later on, some of them came back. Some of them stayed in Pella. Others migrated to Sephirah, the greatest, the greatest population of Jews and Messianics Sephardic. in the world, mm. right? It was in Sephirah, which is Spain, right? Mm. So, but Laos Perinus was, we're, we're finding what, out what were these markers of the Messianic church. Education was a big marker, marker, right? Huge marker. The spirit field, you know, so they were not just learned, they were filled with the spirit, mm. even the Shekinah glory of God, all right? So number seven, Right, are we on to seven? We can be. I just wanted to mention something you'd mentioned to me before the cameras came on, and that was that St. Patrick himself raised how many people from the dead? You said 60. Good night. Yeah, and you know, here's the thing. Okay, there's a lot of exaggerated reports you get in, in ancient literature, especially medieval literature, mm -hmm. about all these miracle stories. You have to judge it by the results. And the results were that the 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 Countries fell like dominoes to the word mm -hmm. because of Patrick's ability to create daily miracles and, uh, and uh, uh, you know, a gift that was passed on to Columba, you know, who went to Scotland, mm -hmm. and of Columbanus, who went to England and even into Germany, carrying the Celtic church with them. And they had the original, remember the received text of the Bible, they had that. They had the Atala, they had the received text of the Bible. The people that studied, when, when St. Patrick was, he was taken by Irish raiders from London, from his family. And you know, this was before London was the huge metropolis it is now. And taken to Ireland where he was a shepherd. And he just, he was a, already a Jewish Christian, a messianic. But he'd kind of, you know, he's a kid. And he'd lost touch with it, right? But then he just started praying and praying. He'd wake up in the morning before first light to pray. And he just prayed constantly. Mm. And uh, boy, the, did Jehovah do work through him? Did Yeshua inhabit him? And at one point, you know, and he prayed, to, prayed for his captors, you know. And at one point, he received the message, okay, go back. You know, go back, go back home. So he, he, he left found a passage over to England and he spent the next three years studying. Hmm. Studying the languages of the Bible, studying the word, and then he went back to Ireland. Supercharged, supercharged and said, I am more than willing to give up my life. Hmm. You know, if God should find me worthy, I'm more than willing to give up my life to carry the word. And uh, he went in there and I, I think one of the first kings that he, he encountered, um, his, there had already been word of him out there, but the king awakened, you know, one day and his son had died in the night, his heir, young man, right? And, and, and it was further compounded by the fact that his daughter had drowned in the river when she got up in the morning to bathe. So mm. he lost both of his children, like just right away. And this, this has to be a godly thing. Because St. Patrick came and he raised both of those children from the dead. Hmm. Wow. All right? And it was not the many times he did this. I mean, it's not like, and, and so that, that, that city say that little kingdom turned to, hmm. turned to the word. So how do we know that these this are not legends of this particular because story? Because these things existed. They actually happened. The, hmm. the, the, they're still here, the Celtic church. I mean, eventually hmm. the, the apostate church banded together allied itself with the nobles and took over these Celtic centers, Celtic church centers by military force mm -hmm. and drove the Celtic clergy out. But these people went up into the mountains, right, where mm -hmm. they could be left to, to their own religion, their own Celtic religion. Uh, Roman Catholicism was established in the plains, but in the mountains, it was up there. They were still oppressed by the church. Many of them immigrated to the new world, to the colonies. And for probably the same reasons, you know, they moved up into the mountains there. They were used to it, and there was still, you know, it was religious freedom in the colonies, but for me, not for you. You mm. know, like if you're not Quaker, what are you living here in our state for, right? 
Right? Gotcha. So they, they moved, I mean, Providence, Rhode Island was established for people of any religion who wanted to practice religion as they saw fit, mm. you know, because there's so much oppression in the colonies. They're still holding on to those old ideas, right? Yeah. That we have the right to impose our religion on everyone. Mm. Okay, so they, they came to the colonies, they went up into the mountains, they were joined by uh, many Scottish, Celtics, and English, right, some Germans, because Columbanus made it all the way to Germany and Bohemia and established, uh, established churches there, hmm. right? So it was a, that, it was a big movement, the Celtic church. Gosh. And, and they, uh, so they were, they were there, and they went up into the mountains, all right, and they took their unique musical instruments with them when they went to the New World. Oh, let's hold that. Hold that thought, <laughs> because that's really interesting. Let's hold that thought. Okay, so unique music. Let's remember that. All right, so thank you for bringing Miles to Shabbat Night Live. I'm thanking you because you made it possible with your donations, and we need you to continue that uh, so that we can, uh, well, first of all, we've got to get them home. <laughs> and second of all, we need to bring this message to other folks so that they can see it as well and uh, enjoy the program like you are. So thank you very much much for supporting Shabbat Night Live. We'll give you a couple minutes to do that. Thank you for your support of Shabbat Night Live. Just a few minutes ago, we were talking about St. Patrick, how it led to the New World and Quakers and all the rest of it, and then we got into music, and I stopped you. Mm -hmm. What does this have to do with music? <laughs> I, I, I was led to this, and I didn't know why, because I really don't know anything about music, but uh, it, it does fascinate me, and I love it, but... Uh, these Celtics, and we started out with St. Patrick is a, a messianic, mm -hmm. very definitely a messianic, came from pure Jewish Christian stock. And his church was messianic in nature. I mean, it was a church of daily miracles. But these, it was finally crushed by the, by the apostate church, and they were driven up into the mountains, and they took their very unique, their worship with them, and their very unique musical instruments, the banjo, the mandolin, what became the slide steel guitar. The accordion was even part of that, which came from North Africa. And uh, so these things, when they immigrated, they were still under oppression for centuries. And so many of them immigrated to the new world and they went up into the mountains. They are taking these unique instruments with them and created a genre of music called bluegrass gospel. Uh, which is spread worldwide. I mean, I was going to go to Australia on a book tour, and I said, are there any bluegrass bands in, in Australia? 
And they sent me a list of the top 10 bluegrass gospel bands in Australia. Wow. <laughs> oh, yeah. So it's everywhere. It's right. The one, in fact, one of the, the Heidi Orchestra, Bluegrass Orchestra, is one of the most popular mm. today in their Norwegian. Wow. <laughs> oh, but they're good. They're so good. All right. They do, they do sing in English. So uh, really, you, you should look this up, bluegrass gospel, because this, this is messianic music. Literally, this is messianic wow, music. Wow, is that ever neat? Yeah, that bluegrass just... gospel. I, I, no, I didn't. I just found it so moving. And I gotta tell you, I was never a big fan of Christian music, all right? Because they didn't seem to worry about the music. The music was never very good, yeah. sometimes. As long as the message is right, it doesn't matter if the music is no good, all right? So uh, never, but then I started listening to bluegrass gospel mm. and I, I just changed. I mean, I was just so touched by it, so moved by it. Huh. And now I appreciate all kinds of Christian music because I, you know, I'm in a new place now, but it's just so moving and it's, uh, it's so real. And this really is literally messianic music, mm. literally. And it's, it sparked another genre of music called country music, which mm. also spread all over the world, which is roots, and anybody will tell you this, they come from bluegrass gospel up in the mountains of the Appalachians where these, where these uh, uh, <clears throat> messianic, Celtic church, you know, remnant went, mm. you know, the, the Irish, the Scottish, English. There were many English Messianics and many Germans. Remember, Columbanus went to Germany, yeah. you know, and to Bohemia and started churches there, Bohemia, Moravia, right, which, is, which became Czechoslovakia. And we'll talk about them later. They were a very early neo-Messianic church. Mm. And uh, uh, so, so they, they went up into the mountains and all these people, People came to gather and formed this bluegrass gospel mm. and took their very unique religion with them and just spawned something fabulous. And, and it's enduring. It has endured. There are young people out there just doing great bluegrass gospel. You, know, you I guess really, I, really, go look it up. Go on YouTube. There's just some, some just great people. It shouldn't be surprising, I guess, to me because the last time you were here, the last series we did, you mentioned it was um, some, some town in North Carolina has... Uh, a preservation of the Hebrew Gospels, um, and it was up. It was up in the hills again somewhere. It's Valdez. Thank you. Yes. Yeah, but the, actually, I I called them up and checked out, and they don't have uh, any Hebrew Gospels. It, they didn't make the the trip, so I'm going to take them one. Okay. Yeah. You can go with Let's, me. We'll film it. Okay. No, I'm serious. We'll listen to some bluegrass on oh, the way. Not, yeah. <laughs> No, no, we're, we're going to make a beautiful, because remember, one of the things I did when I, when I went on my latest expedition to find the underground Bibles is I discovered, rediscovered the earliest Waldensian Bible. These were the mm. Neo-Messianics up in the Italic Sea in Lombardy in that area. Right. Who had preserved the, the Hebrew Gospels and the Italic Bible and the received texts in Greek of, of Lucy. And they'd even translated them into, uh, uh, they'd translated them into the early European languages, which is just a mind blower. Because you, you, I found, I found these mm. Roman, Roman Bible, which was the language they spoke in that area. And it has the markers of the Hebrew Gospel. Wow. I mean, it, one of them, for example, is the preface, will say, that Matthew, for example, was originally written in Hebrew. Huh. It's in the preface. You won't find that in the preface of any Greek gospel. Wow. But it's in the Hebrew gospels, the preface, and it's in the, the Hebrew manuscript tradition. But there are other markers, like they use the name of the Hebrew name of the Savior. Yeshua, so even though they don't Yeshua have, HaMashiach. These folks in North Carolina don't have a copy of that Bible. Their no, lineage is clearly from, it, it is. from there. So I thought, well, I'll put it in a nice binding and take yeah, it to them so idea. they'll have it, you know. Yeah. So we'll go, we'll well, go and film it. Well, back to today, number seven. Number you seven, a... Messianic, Messianic scribes. And so we're, we're talking about the neo-Messianic movements. Yeah. We talked about Italy, Northern Italy, the Waldensians are what they came to be called. Remember, these people just called themselves Christians. It was the church who later gave them, gave them names, usually after a leader like Peter Waldo, who didn't appear until the 12th century, and they were much earlier than that. But they called them Waldensians, like they were latecomers, and they were just a, these, all these churches are just a plague of heretical pests, right? But they weren't. <laughs> they were much more of a unified church yeah. than that, a unified movement. They may be different denominations, 
but they all Spirit was held the to the same yeah. uh, concept of restoring the original Messianic Apostolic Church. Huh. That was what held them together. Some differences in document, doctrine, but basically they all held to the same thing. Hmm. So you had the Waldensians in Italy, we're talking Middle Ages now, and the Cathars in Southern France, and you have in Spain, you have a resurgent Messianic Church, you know, and these are, these are, these are actually Jews. There was a huge population of Jews, like a half million wow. in the Middle Ages. Huge, all right? Huge part of the population, too. And about half of them, more than half, actually, converted to Christianity. So they're literally Jewish Christian conversos, they were called. Wow. They were called, they were all called other things. They were called Moranos, and they were, they were called other things, mostly heretics. Okay. <laughs> but they, they're not, they created their own, their own church, was, which was very different than the Roman church because they had, uh, uh, <coughs> they had a different basic religion, but they had their, their the, the point is that these scribes, the Messianic scribes, we, we'll get to the other in a minute, they had Messianic scribes, Jewish scribes too, but Messianic scribes tended to be more trusted because they were converts. Oh, okay. Right, now Messianic is a modern word, but it, it very effectively, you know, uh, defines all of these groups. They're followers of the Hebrew Messiah. Right, they were Messianics. Sure. Okay, and these were Jewish Christian Messianics, conversos were. Okay, and they were more trusted than the Jews were. But then they came out of the same educational tradition. So they knew Hebrew and they knew mm. other languages. They're big on languages, right? Education is always huge in Messianic cultures and, and neo Messianic cultures. Okay, so this during the golden age of Spain, which was caused by this this convivencia between the the Jews and, and and Messianics and the Muslims and the Christians, there were times when they got on together. Convivencia means living together, all right? And they, and they cooperated. So all of this, the gr classics of Greece liter Greek literature had been banned. Greek was banned. Once mm. the Roman church, you know, they banned, they banned the Hebrew gospels and the Messianic scriptures. But then once they split from the Greek church, they banned Greek too. Oh gosh, wow. All right? So, uh, all these classics over the centuries had just been lost to the East. That's why they call it the Dark Ages. You know, what we call the model of Western civilization was created by Greece and, the, and their, their early studies in the sciences, you know? Well, that was lost. It was all gone, hmm. right? And now it's coming back into Europe thanks to Messianic scribes who knew Arabic, who knew Hebrew, who knew the languages of Europe, who knew Latin, and they translated it back into the languages of Europe. And we're talking about works of Plato, Galen, Aristotle. I wow. Mean, you know, people you know, they had been lost. So these were lost, but Greek yet the- Greek manuscripts had the, been lost, not all of them. But the Arabic them. folks had preserved it in their the, language. The Nestorian church, which was a neo Messianic okay. church, had gone to the Church of the East, and they became huge. They were yeah. the, in the Middle Ages, they were the largest church in the world. 70 bishoprics from, from the Middle East to China, across hmm. India and across the Mesopotamian area, and up north and down south, and they had really spread. You know, and they were big right there in Babylon. They created a uh, uh, what they called is a center of uh, wisdom, right? And uh, Nestorians taught these Greek classics to, and Arabs flocked from all over the world to come and learn from huh. these Nestorians in, in, wow. in, in, in Babylon. And, and you know, and uh, those it was those kind of works that were then taken. They had translated them into Arabic, and now. Now they're coming into Spain. They're being retranslated back into the European languages. Love that. So it was hidden in, he, hidden in Arabic and then brought back out almost. Right. So That's the, great. But the thing is the Messianics were reading these in Hebrew mm -hmm. long before anybody in the West. They knew about Aristotle. They knew about Galen, the, the, uh. the original. I mean, the, Galen's work on medicine and Avicenna's work on medicine. I mean, the, the Middle Ages, they were just stuck. They, they didn't go anywhere with medicine at all. And then, then they, they were able to recapture these Greek classics of Galen and Avicenna. And uh, uh, it, 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 then they just surged forward in their, in their knowledge of medicine. They, so were just totally, they were totally ignorant. 
I'm sure Hippocrates was part of that too. Yeah, and, and part of it was planned because uh, the apostate church was repressing all of this. Huh. Not just the Hebrew, but the Greek also, because that was their competition, right? Right. Okay, so they had been lost, hmm. just neglected, possibly burned some of them, or just neglected and not recopied. And then it comes back in from the East, from the Orient, translated back from Arabic into the languages of Europe. And Toledo, which was the center of the Messianic Church, in Sephirot in Spain was the gateway to the Orient. And mm. scholars would come from all over Europe to Toledo and they were not disappointed because mm. they found all these incredible priceless classics there that were, they were, were the Messianic scribes wow. were working on translating, and Jewish scribes and others uh, were working on translating back into the European languages. That's and amazing. That, that's what pulled that's what pulled the Middle Ages out, uh, the Dark Ages. That's what pulled them out, mm. was this golden age in Spain. And of course, it added to their technology, you know, and their practice of medicine and all of this. They were, they were the civilization of the world, mm. you know, at the time. You know, Celtic had been, but they were destroyed by the apostate church, wiped that, wiped that little segment of the Messianic church out, and now it's in Spain. Mm. And that sparked a little thing because once they wiped it out there, which they did, you know, uh, with the Inquisition, uh, all these Messianics went all over the world. A lot of them went to Italy and sparked a little thing called the Renaissance. Uh -huh. So the, the, the golden age of Spain and encompassed in the, in the Messianics who went throughout the world everywhere. And they were major, major players in, the, in, in creating the Renaissance. Not the only players, I'm not trying to... No, they were the catalyst. But they were, they were very much the catalyst. And uh, anyway. That is amazing. Now, it, it we only amazing. have about five minutes left. We need to get to point number eight here that you wanted to bring out. Yes, point number eight. They created a resurgent Messianic church. Hmm. Okay, so this was, I mean, it was 250,000 strong. A quarter of a million Jews had converted to Christianity. Now, it is true, some of them were forced conversions, all right? Mm -hmm. Which is an abomination to Judaism, but apparently not to this new, <laughs> new Roman church, Greco-Roman church, all right? Okay, but it is an abomination to force people to do that, um, because that, what, what does that have to do with salvation, all right? But they were forcing them that was the only answer they had. And, and you know, remember that back during the early Messianic church, Jews were converting by the scores, by the thousands, you know, because it's the, their Hebrew Messiah offering them salvation, offering them the spirit, you know, not taking away anything hmm. from the law, but offering them the spirit. Yeshua brought us this sense of the spirit of the law, you know, that is as important or more important even than the letter of the law. What good is the letter of the law if you don't understand the spirit of the law? You're just following rules, right? Right. It's the spirit of the law that matters and because Yehovah is in, the, in, it, in that, you know. Okay, so they, they, were, they were flocking. So there really was not any resistance by the Jews uh, to, to the Messiah until, you know, the apostate church became oppressive. And then the Jews started to associate the New, New Testament, the Brit Hadashah, with this oppression as if Yeshua himself, or rather Jesus Christ, was the origin of their oppression. Obviously, they were, they were judging people by their behavior, by Christian behavior, which was atrocious. And they said, well, that must be what is taught in that New Testament, hmm. that this Jesus Christ is teaching them to hate Jews, right? And to oppress them and to kill them, right? Right. So that's what's in the, hmm. in the Brit Hadashah, in the New Testament, judging by the behavior of these people that claim to be following those principles. Okay, now Jews are not converting, right? Okay, but the Messianic church comes along in Spain and they're teaching, they're gonna, we're gonna have the, we're gonna ha, we're gonna ha, it's a Hebrew story. We're going to have the gospels in Hebrew for our church. All right, mm -hmm. and they were still extant at the time. They're still out there. All right, so that's where the Hebrew Gospels from Catalonia come from. In fact, they were translated into Catalan for those who didn't really know enough Hebrew, and later on they were retranslated back into mm -hmm. Spanish and back into Hebrew uh, because if you 
you know, the, here, here's the thing. Uh, if they had wanted to translate the Latin Vulgate, they would have translated the Latin Vulgate. They wanted the Hebrew Gospels. So they took the Catalan Gospels, which we have, we have that, that survived. So you can compare them and see that that definitely was, definitely was translated from Hebrew and then it was translated back into Hebrew. Mm. So that, that's how they survived. Great place to hide if you're burning all Hebrew manuscripts and put them in the Catalan manuscript, yeah. right? <laughs> right? So the, this was one of the early European languages that, that wow. Hebrew, the Hebrew Gospels were translated into. Uh, so it comes back to us through them. You have the Hebrew Gospels that are part of this resurgent Messianic church, and they had their own bishops. They had their own, you know, they had their own synagogues because many of the synagogues were empty because mm. of all these conversions. So they, they got their same synagogue they were using. The rabbis converted, so they, they had wow. the same rabbi that they had. They are sincere believers. In, in the Messiah. There were some people who weren't. They were called crypto-Jews. But the narrative has been to sell the fact that all conversos were crypto-Jews, which is just incredibly false and incredibly demeaning. Many of these, thousands of these, died for this faith in the Hebrew Messiah without renouncing it. Wow. And without renouncing anyone else. You know, they just died without saying a word because they knew there was no point that they were gonna be burned alive anyway for their faith. So, I mean, the, those stories and these people, we cannot let these people's sacrifice be in vain. These are people who held on to their faith in the Hebrew Messiah, regardless of the fact that they were tortured in every way that man could devise to torture people. Wow. And, uh, and they were killed and in as horrible a manner as possible. They would even use green wood when they burned them mm. so that the fire would, would would last longer, it wouldn't be as hot, so it would take half an hour for them to die. It was just horrible. It's really horrible. It's really like using a scrub brush on your soul to, to, to read about the things that the apostate church did in the Inquisition. Mm. And these were done, most people don't really know that these things were done in order to crush the resurgent Messianic church. Everyone's heard of the Spanish Inquisition, but they don't know what it was about. It was specifically to crush the Messianic, the resurgent Messianic church. Wow. Let's hold that thought. Let's continue next week. Okay. We're only halfway down the story here, if that. So yeah. we'll continue next week. Uh, thank you for joining us. And thank you for joining us. Thanks for joining us on Shabbat Night Live. There's lots more to tell. So come back next week. We'll tell more with Miles Jones. Until then, Shavua Tov. Have a great week. We'll see you then. Shalom, Torah fans. Give this video a thumbs up and share it with a friend. Tap the subscription button and the bell icon, and I promise to update weekly with in-depth biblical research. Be sure to download the new michaelrood.tv app for both mobile and home devices for even more commercial-free content.